CBN News at 9. America's long experience with the segregation we have put behind us and the racial discrimination we still struggle to overcome requires a special effort to make real the promise of equal opportunity for all. And with that, President Bush the administration is, will continue to actually promote the is stirring up a hornet's nest in the debate over affirmative action, saying it is not the way to racial equality. Good evening, I'm Allison Payne. And I'm Steve Sanders. Here's what's new at 9. President Bush is challenging the University of Michigan's admissions policy, telling the Supreme Court the policy is discriminatory. Democrats are upset, civil rights activists are furious, and the nation is now engaged in a new debate about an explosive issue. WGN's Grant Rampey is on Capitol Hill with the fallout. Grant, good evening. Evening, Steve. Bush is jumping into what is clearly a high-stakes legal and political debate over civil rights, and he is jumping in with both feet. The president, late today, speaking out about what he says is clear-cut discrimination at one of the nation's biggest public universities. At their core, the Michigan policies amount to a quota system that unfairly rewards or penalizes prospective students based solely on their race. Bush says the intent of Michigan's admission standards, which give extra weight to applications from minority students, may be good, but the results are not. He says the policy is unconstitutional. Thank you very much. Whoa. Conservatives have been pushing him to speak up. Now Democrats are blasting him. They complain the strong stand Bush took against Trent Lott's recent racially insensitive remarks and his stand on affirmative action don't sync up. Actions speak louder than word, Mr. President. This is a watershed moment for the administration. Top Senate Democrat Tom Daschle says Republicans have to decide whether they're for diversity or not. While Ted Kennedy argues Bush is forsaking his constitutional obligation to be inclusive. The administration has walked away from that commitment, from that promise, from that guarantee. The White House response, Bush says there are better ways to help minority students. Recent history has proven that diversity can be achieved without using quotas. This will soon be taken up by the U.S. Supreme Court. The White House is filing what is known as a friend of the court brief to lay out the president's position. But of course, it is still up to the judges to, to decide whether they think the Michigan policy is unconstitutional or not. Allison, we will not know their decision for months. Now, Grant, the president has to know that his position could alienate many minority voters who Republicans were hoping to lure to their side in 2004. Does the White House appear worried about that? Apparently not so worried that the president's willing to keep quiet. He had the choice of inflaming conservatives by not doing anything or inflaming minorities by taking the stand he took. He chose to side with his base. All right, WGN's Grant Rampey, thank you. So how do local activists feel about the president's stance on affirmative action? Well, they're not amused. Officials at the University of Illinois at Chicago say their students are not chosen based on a quota, but one activist says that such programs are necessary. WGN's Juan Carlos Von Hool is in the newsroom with that story. Juan Carlos. Well, Allison, the president of the Southside NAACP feels this is a big slap in the face for African Americans. The reason, even though Martin Luther King's birthday is celebrated on Monday, he was born today, January 15th. It's tragic, based upon the fact that today is Martin Luther King's actual birthday. Reverend Doris Roberts, the head of the Southside NAACP, says he simply can't believe it that President Bush, on the day that Martin Luther King would have turned 74 years old, is bashing an affirmative action program at the University of Michigan. Many of those gains in the 60s, early 70s, that were accomplished by and because of Martin's leadership uh, are now being uh, questioned are uh, now being used against, really against the black race. Robert says any action against affirmative action is a step backwards and anticipates many civil rights organizations will rally against Bush. Locally, UIC officials say any decision taken by the Supreme Court will not affect them. In an urban setting, you don't need quotas. We admit students without regard to race. Um, we have an extremely diverse applicant pool. We have an extremely diverse student body, one of the most diverse in the country. In fact, there is no ethnic majority in our student body. We're all minorities. So how do students feel about it? Unfortunately, the system of quotas 
in some ways it does work, but in some ways, I mean, it disregards merit. And I don't like knowing that I get a position just because I'm filling a spot. I think there are, have been problems with affirmative action, but I think that doesn't mean we should throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think that means you need to reform affirmative action and that some form of it is, is needed to help people. Now, some students we talked with felt that instead of quotas, more qualified teachers should be placed at the high school level so all students trying to get into college can compete on an even keel based on merit alone. Steve, there's much more backlash yet to come on President Bush's move today. There certainly is one Carlos Von Hool on the University of Michigan lawsuit. Thank you. Chicago police are looking for a man who robbed and sexually assaulted a University of Illinois Chicago student near the campus. The woman was attacked last night in the 1400 block of West Flournoy Street. Police say the attacker grabbed the woman around the neck as she walked into her apartment building. That woman has given investigators a description of the suspect. Four young men faced a judge today in Bridgeview. They are accused of raping a 16-year-old girl. Prosecutors say the high school students assaulted the girl at a party in Burr Ridge last month and videotaped it. And as WGN's Muriel Clare reports, tensions rose outside the courthouse. It's not something they want to talk about. One of them, Burr and Bazzari, not only didn't want to talk, he took great pain to shield himself from the cameras. Earlier, 17-year-old Bazzari and his three buddies, Adrian Miss Brenner, Sonny Smith, and Christopher Robbins, appeared in court before Judge David Sturba. Prosecutors say on December 7th, in one of the teenagers' home, the four engaged in some heavy drinking, and a 16-year-old girl who was with them apparently drank until she passed out. Prosecutors say the four then sexually assaulted the girl and scrawled offensive language on her body. One of the boys is accused of videotaping the whole thing. In court today, the prosecutor asking that the teenager's $100,000 bond be increased turned the 20-minute tape over to the judge for his viewing. The judge viewed the tape but denied the prosecutor's motion for a bond increase. I think the state's activities were, were probably motivated by what they anticipate will be the filing of more serious charges, so they were prompted to uh, uh, seek an increase in bail, which I think the judge did the appropriate thing by not increasing the amount of... The judge didn't increase the bond, but he imposed some conditions. The four teenagers now will be subject to random drug testing, and they are housebound except to attend school or court. One of them, 18-year-old Christopher Robbins, will be given permission to participate in the Illinois National Guard weekend activities as need be. Robbins' attorney says Robbins joined the Guard but won't become full-time until after he completes his senior year in school. The four teenagers will be back in court at the end of the month. They'll enter pleas and a trial judge will be assigned. In Broadview, Muriel Clare, WGN News. Well, each is charged as an adult and faces 140 counts of aggravated criminal sexual assault and child pornography. Charges are still pending tonight against a man from Chicago who police say ran a sex slave ring involving young girls. Authorities say seven women and girls were held against their will in this house on Detroit's east side. Investigators believe the victims were kidnapped and forced to work as prostitutes. The 32-year-old Chicagoan and a 17-year-old boy are in custody. Closing arguments today in the trial of two men accused of killing a man during a brawl at a wedding reception. Defense attorneys for Timothy Brogan and Ronald Schickel Jr. said there was too much chaos for anyone to know what happened when Michael Chambers died in August of 2000. The prosecutors say Schickel started the fight and then put Chambers in a fatal chokehold when he tried to act as a peacemaker. On his third day in office, Illinois' new governor flew around the state talking about the budget crisis. Ron Blagojevich stopped in Rockford, Peoria, Marion, and the Quad Cities. He repeated his promise not to raise taxes to uh, plug the state's $5 billion deficit. He says if state jobs and salaries are cut, they will affect upper management before rank-and-file workers. Instead, we're going to the upper-level people, uh, and my office will not be immune to this when it comes to some of these sacrifices. If you want to lead, you should lead by example. That's what our new way of doing business will be about. And let me just say that... Well, Blagojevich says his administration is developing a long-term plan to address the budget problems. That's something he says George Ryan's office failed to do. A key witness in the government's case against George Ryan's former chief of staff took the stand today. Scott Faywell is on trial on charges of racketeering and corruption. And as WGN's Dana Kozlov reports, the first witness described Faywell as a man who used his power to abuse the system. 
Richard Giuliano is a key witness in the government's corruption case against George Ryan's former chief of staff, Scott Faywell, and he spent the entire day on the witness stand outlining Faywell as a boss who often ordered Secretary of State employees to wear two hats, full-time government staffer and campaign worker. Giuliano also testified that Faywell used taxpayers' money to pay for campaign work, then ordered a cleanup of the Inspector General's office when an investigation was launched. Assistant U.S. Attorney Patrick Collins focused on this memo, written by Scott Faywell to George Ryan. Giuliano says he remembers Faywell writing, let's get someone in there who won't screw our friends, won't ask about fundraising tickets. Giuliano also described a political climate in which government Secretary of State contracts or raises were given in exchange for political support to George Ryan's campaign. Giuliano says one contract in particular went to former lawmaker Roger Stanley, currently under indictment in a related case. Then there's Phil Graham's presidential campaign. He says Faywell and George Ryan recruited several Secretary of State employees to work on that 96 bid, with Ryan then stating, why don't we include a consulting line item in our proposal so our people can make some money? Giuliano says they did and funneled that cash through Alan Drazek's business. This is one of the checks Giuliano received and he says Faywell also got a cut. But Giuliano did not directly connect that cash to George Ryan or any of Ryan's family members. And his defense has painted Faywell as an overworked aide who just carried out business as usual. I think we have to wait for cross-examination tomorrow by Mr. Jensen because, as he said in his opening statement, there are two sides, so I don't think we should go by Giuliano's interpretation. Giuliano pled guilty to one count of mail fraud in this case last April. He's expected to be on the stand for two more days. In Chicago, Dana Kozlov, WGN News. Baywell's trial is expected to take eight weeks. Just ahead on WGN News. Challenging Governor Ryan's blanket clemency, the Cook County State's Attorney's Office is still fuming about the governor's last-minute moves. Tonight, his strategy to fight even more of the cases, and then later. I'm Dina Baer on the Medical Watch, relieving back pain by replacing the part that hurts. A new approach to disc problems coming up on the Medical Watch. Have you ever noticed somebody's always too hot or too cold? Well, a surprising study about office thermostats and what might be happening or not happening when you adjust the temperature. I'm Tom Skilling. Chicago is missing a snowstorm, but just barely. We'll tell you where it's going to snow in downstate Illinois and Indiana, and we'll look at a continuation in the area's coldest weather yet, with even colder air due next week. It could go sub-zero at that time. All that coming up, plus the weekend outlook. You're watching WGN News at 9 with Steve Sanders, Allison Payne, Tom Skilling, and Dan Rohn. This is Chicago's very own WGN News at 9. Well and Grace, well and Grace, well and Grace, well and Grace, five days a week right here. I'm totally listening. I'm all ears. Go. Willing Grace, willing Grace, five days a week. Five days a week. Right here at 7.30 Eastern on Superstation WGN. New scrubbing bubbles are about to bowl you over. Introducing Fizzit's toilet tablets. They hit the water working, releasing the power-packed bubbles that clean the bowl, lifting and loosening the toughest stains, so you just brush and flush. No more lame liquids or spills, because Fizzits are the new wave in toilet cleaning. Fizzits Toilet Tablets, new from Scrubbing Bubbles. They work hard so you don't have to. S.C. Johnson, a family company. What's it like to crunch into a twist? Lift yourself off the floor. Caramel, chocolate, kiki, crunch. Take the tour to more. Twix mix, give me some more. Let's do that again. Can you lose weight and still live your life? No problem. Slim Fast made it very easy. I never felt deprived of anything, and I was losing weight. Hey, we're talking choices. Rich, creamy shakes, meal on the go bars. Slim Fast has snack bars. You can take it anywhere. Now let's talk taste. Oh my gosh, the Slim Fast shakes are so delicious. Just like a chocolate milkshake from an ice cream store, Slim Fast worked great for me. And it just works for me. And it felt like I was doing it the right way. Slim Fast, it's your life. Feed it right. 
brilliant performance. It's the Kiwi Express sponge, the only sponge equipped with a unique liquid reservoir that always delivers a brilliant shine. The Kiwi Express sponge, a brilliant shine every time. Expect more legal challenges to former Governor Ryan's decision to clear out death row. That is the word from Cook County State's Attorney's Office, Dick Devine's office. Ten cases have already been challenged, and WGN's Jackie Bang is at the update desk to tell us dozens more challenges could follow. Jackie. Allison, of the more than 160 death row cases commuted, about 90 of them come from Cook County. Tonight, Dick Devine is looking at his legal options. Some he has already taken, others he's about to. Where there are legitimate questions, we're going to raise them. The first question was raised and filed yesterday in the Illinois Supreme Court. It centers on the legal definition of conviction. Devine argues 10 of the men were in the process of being resentenced. And if they weren't sentenced, they really weren't convicted. A conviction requires both a judgment and a sentence. Therefore, they were not within the group of people that the governor could grant clemency to in any form. We think that legally, uh, the state's attorney, Devine, is on very, very shaky ground. John Stainthorpe represents two of the inmates whose death sentences were commuted. Both Cortez Brown and William Bracey are also among the ten named in Devine's motion. He disagrees with Devine's definition of the word conviction. Once a conviction, a guilt-innocence conviction, has occurred, the governor at that point has the power to uh, commute sentences and to uh, avoid the possibility of a death sentence. While that argument awaits the state's highest court, today William Bracey was sentenced to life in prison. Meanwhile, Devine is looking at other legal avenues. About a dozen death row inmates, including Roger Collins, did not sign the clemency petition. They wanted to stay on death row. That's one legal argument, unsigned petitions. Another argument, while most death sentences were commuted to life in prison, Devine argues certain cases didn't have that sentence as an option. He is also expected to challenge the governor's broad power to issue clemency. We're in virtually new ground here. We're in uh, unprecedented territory. For the motion filed Monday, the first step is whether the Illinois Supreme Court will even consider his motion. That decision could take a few weeks. If the high court does, each side will then file their arguments. Expect the other challenges to be filed soon. Steve? All right, Jackie, thank you. You know, one of those pardoned by Governor Ryan and uh, set free last week is Aaron Patterson. A little later in this newscast, my one-on-one -on -one conversation with Mr. Patterson, his thoughts on blanket clemency, and how he found out he was going to be pulled off of death row and set free. That's Patterson's story, coming up a little later in this newscast. A judge has decided that the teenage suspect in last year's deadly sniper shootings can be tried as an adult in one of the sniper slayings. That means 17-year-old John Lee Malvo could face the death penalty. The judge made the ruling after hearing testimony from 25 witnesses who tried to link Malvo to the rifle used in the shootings. Malvo and John Lee Muhammad are suspected in 18 shootings and 13 deaths in the Washington, D.C. area. Now some international news. North Korea is ridiculing a U.S. offer to hold talks on its nuclear weapons program in exchange for possible food and energy aid. WG and Sonia Dina reports from Washington, the country's state-run media called those offers pie in the sky. U.S. Envoy James Kelly in Beijing considering China's offer to host talks between the U.S. and North Korea. There's no substitute for communication. But North Korea does not appear interested in talking if it means scrapping its nuclear program. Its state-run news agency called recent U.S. overtures deceptive and pie in the sky. Comments the White House shrugged off. Well, it's always very hard to read North Korea. North Korea has a habit of saying very many inflammatory things. Yesterday, President Bush offered for the first time incentives to the poverty-stricken country, the possibility of food and energy, but only if North Korea disarms. On Capitol Hill, Democrats support the president's latest position, but... But this flip-flopping and this, uh, this uh, change in position from one day to the next sends a very conflicting and confusing message, not only to the North Koreans, but to the international community. 
Meantime, amid signs North Korea has increased military patrols near the border, 37,000 U.S. soldiers continue their training at the DMZ, there to protect South Korea, paying attention to the crisis, but sticking to the regular schedule. Our activities haven't changed any. We haven't added to the train schedule and we haven't taken away from the train schedule. As for possible talks, the White House says it's still waiting for an official response from North Korea. In Washington, Sonia Diener, WGN News. So far, there are no plans for talks between the U.S. and North Korea, but next week, officials from North and South Korea will meet. The South hopes to persuade its neighbor to give up its nuclear ambitions. And now tomorrow's headlines tonight in the Chicago Tribune, where there is a report that the shortage of classroom teachers in Illinois is easing up slightly. It's not a big number, but there were 100 fewer teaching vacancies in the state this year when compared to last. Before that, the vacancy number had been rising steadily.